Right, hello everyone. Um, thanks for coming to see me, uh, rather than Walter. Uh, I do admire Walter greatly. Um, right, today I'm going to talk about abstraction, the true superpower of C++. But first, about me. I'm the head of engineering practice at Creative Assembly. We make Total War, um, and I've been there for 23 years. And uh, you should all go and buy Total War games straight after this presentation. Um, we also make Alien Isolation. Quite a lot of people like that. So, you know, we're, I'm proud of the games that I've worked on. You can find me on Twitter at uh, hatcat01. Uh, I am the chair of BSI IST slash 5, which, as you all know, is the um, mirror group for uh, ISO slash IEC JTC1 SC22. <laughs> I'm the chair of programming languages for the British Standards Institute. I'm also a member of BSI IST slash 5 slash hyphen slash 21, which is the British Standards Institute C++ panel. Uh, and I'm also a voting member of It's the C++ Standards Committee. I sit on committees. It's a thing. I enjoy it. It's, it's, I don't know why. I do. I'm a member of BAFTA, which surprises people a lot. Um, it's not as glamorous as it sounds, but I'm pleased to. Uh, pleased to be a member. Um, I'm, I'm on the advisory board of IGGY, Intelligent Games and Gaming Intelligence. If anyone fancies studying artificial intelligence in games, go there. See if you fancy doing some postdoctoral research, or doctoral research, sorry. Uh, I'm a STEM ambassador. I go to schools and colleges and universities and convince young people to study science and technology and engineering and maths because I think it's really important and we do not have enough engineers, not by a long chalk, especially in these days. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Fashion Include. Uh, there is another founder, in, at least one other founder in here. There she is. Um, we had our fifth birthday last Monday, I think it was. Uh, I'm a code of conduct hobbyist. Um, in this, I'm not paid to do it. I'm on the code of conduct for five C++ conferences. Um, if anybody else feels like having a go, That'd be, that'd be super great, because I have to do this all on my annual leave, and my wife would like to go on holiday with me. Hi, Sinead. Hope you're watching. Uh, I'm a husband, father, singer, musician. Act I wrote all this down. Singer, musician, actor, director, chef, bon viveur. Um, these are all things I've been accused of being. Or uh, beard wearer and cataplect, which after this morning's talk from Tony, you might know what one of those is, um, which rather spoils the joke, but there we are. Um, Tony's talk was great. Who was here for Tony's talk? Oh, great. Okay. Uh, Tony covered a lot of my material. Um, we weren't working in collaboration. Um, but Kate rather kindly and wisely pointed out afterwards that it is the case that there are themes emerging about what needs teaching to the community. Um, abstraction certainly is one of those themes. Um, I'm also the co-author of Beautiful C++. Um, a book about the C++ core guidelines. Who's heard about the core guidelines? Oh, come on. Right, C++ core guidelines. Magical device. Um, find out what they are. Who's bought my book? Who's read my book? <laughs> the record shows a somewhat disappointing response. <laughs> um, yeah, ask about the core guidelines if you've never heard. Um, Kate or I will talk to you forever. Um, we're taking it in turns, actually, to say how much the other did and how little they did. And Kate raised it up a notch at ACC this year, this year by saying that I wrote the book, which, while technically true, um, without, her, there would, without her, there would have been no book. So I'm looking at her now. I can make her blush. Uh, <laughs> she devised it, and she reviewed it, and she gave close editing commentary, and she cheered me on. Um, and she showed me that there is a lot more to writing a book than writing the words. Thank you, Kate. Uh, here's our agenda, the nature of abstraction, C++ features that support abstraction, and the art of working at the correct level of abstraction. It's a simple talk. I'm hoping we'll be over in 50 minutes. Oh, I should also remark, it's a new talk. An early version was delivered at CPP on C a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's also a new talking style and a new delivery system for me, so... You know, I welcome feedback. Please ask questions throughout. 
But let's look at the nature of abstraction first. I'm going to start with a little etymology. Um, I asked a bunch of folk what they understood by the word abstraction, and I got a big pile of rather varied answers. Um, the Latin root of the word is trahere, which means to drag or pull. It gives us words like tractor. Do we have tractors in Canada? Good, I had to check, right. It, <laughs> it also gives us the word subtract, subtrahere, literally to pull under, but more meaningfully to take from, um, as well as retract, to pull back, for example, to retract a statement. As we have contract or contract, which is drag or draw together, and a contract draws together two parties in agreement. Um, and extract, to draw out, extract and retract may seem quite similar. And one of the confusions we have is the precise use of the prefixes. And when we come to abstract, which means to draw off from uh, or to draw away from, we might be grasping for a meaningful understanding of the word. And worse still, the word abstract can be a noun or an adjective or a verb. So looking at nouns, an abstract can be a summary of a longer publication or a theoretical way of looking at things. So something that exists only in an idealized form. Used as an adjective, it can mean conceptual or ideal, and it can also mean difficult to understand, which I find typical of the English language. Used as a verb, it means to summarize or extract by means of distillation or to produce an abstraction. Um, after writing this presentation, I was left with the notion that to abstract means to form a conceptual summary. Right, plectary. Well, we all know what this means now, don't we? Thanks, Tony. It means to fold or twist or braid. Um, a simplex is actually a single fold or a triangle. Um, monoplex and uniplex are synonyms. So a cataplect is a map folder. I'm very particular about folding things properly, particularly maps. Whenever I unfold a map and it's got the creases in the wrong place and I try and fold it back and I fight with the map, that makes me unreasonably, peculiarly, and frankly, unnecessarily angry. Um, clothes, I don't fold clothes. Somebody else does that. Uh, duplex, that means twofold. Uh, two floors in a building, two suites in an apartment, that's called a duplex suite. Two-way communication, forwards and backwards along the same cable. Uh, complex means many-fold, multiply braided. Um, and multiplex means multi-complex, comprising several interleaved parts. Um, complexity describes the idea of being unable to see the forest for the trees. Things are interleaved in ways which defy simple or simplex apprehension. However, the results of all the folding and complication is a new thing in itself. So I hope you can see there is a relationship between abstraction and complexity. Abstraction seeks to draw away the essence while complexity seeks to create new things by weaving together old things. Now, we need to cover the closely related concepts of encapsulation and information hiding. They are often used interchangeably with the word abstraction, usually at the cost of clarity. So encapsulation is the process of enclosing one or more things into a single entity. Confusingly, that entity is called an encapsulation. C++ offers a number of encapsulation mechanisms. The class, that's the most obvious one. Um, take some data, take some functions, wrap them up in a pair of braces, put class or struct and an identifier at the front. Um, and there's also the enumeration. Take a bunch of constants, wrap them up in a pair of braces, put enum and an identifier at the front. Function definitions, they're a form of encapsulation. Take a bunch of instructions, wrap them up in a pair of braces, put an identifier and a pair of parentheses, optionally containing parameters at the front. Namespaces, take a bunch of definitions and declarations, wrap them up in a pair of braces and put namespace and an optional identifier on the outside. Source files work in a similar way. Take a bunch of definitions and declarations, put them in a file, save it to your file system with a name. Modules are the first new encapsulation mechanism in quite a while. Um, these work in a similar way to source files. Take a bunch of definitions and declarations, put them in a file, add the export keyword at the top, and save it to your file system with a name. 
Encapsulation is only part of the story, as anyone with any experience of modules will tell you. All we've done in each of these examples is gathered things together and, and named them as a single entity. If we're smart, we will have gathered related things together. Now, information hiding is a more subtle activity, requiring you to make more careful decisions. In addition to gathering, you must decide which items you are going to reveal to the outside world and which you are going to hide. Now, information hiding implies that, this, that some encapsulation is taking place, but encapsulation does not imply that information hiding is taking place. Some of the encapsulation mechanisms of C++ support information hiding. The class offers us access levels. Members within the private implementation are hidden from the clients of the struct. And this is how we relieve clients of the burden of enforcing class invariance. By hiding the implementation and thus preventing clients from breaking them. The enumeration offers no information hiding. There is no way of exposing only a few members of an enumeration. Functions hide information perfectly by merely exposing an identifier and a return type while hiding away the implementation. And namespaces can expose declarations and hide definitions by distributing over more than one file. Header and source files do the same thing as do modules. Abstraction is a tricky word and matters aren't helped by the fact that the result of an abstraction is an abstraction. Just as an encapsulation is the result of encapsulation. Sometimes I hate English. Let us consider the process of abstraction. In the same way, that we just consider the process of encapsulation and information hiding. In a programming context, abstraction means identifying and isolating the important parts of a problem and drawing them off and discarding the remainder. And we separate them from the details of implementation. We label abstractions with identifiers. So again, consider the nature of a function. We bundle a set of instructions into a single entity and label it. The function is an abstraction with a name meaningful to the problem domain. Similarly, with classes, the class is an abstraction with a name meaningful to the problem domain, containing relevant functionality to model behavior implied by the name. However, the art of abstraction is deciding what should be within the scope of the abstraction and what should stay outside. And I use the word art advisedly. This is where it differs from mere encapsulation. There is no mechanical method for deciding where to draw the line between what is relevant to the abstraction and what is not. The ability comes with practice and experience. Now, you may have heard me use the phrase problem domain. Before I came to this talk, I assumed there was no controversy about the difference between problem domain and solution domain. And I was wrong. And simply typing problem domain versus solution domain into Google was quite enlightening. Now, this is from a blog called Shar World, which unfortunately has been inactive since uh, July 2017. Problem domain, or problem space, is an engineering term referring to all information that defines the problem and constrains the solution, the constraints being part of the problem. Solution domain defines the abstract environment where the solution is developed. Um, he then goes on to say the differences between these two domains are the cause for possible errors when the solution is planted into the problem domain. And this is a very significant point. So consider the int keyword. Does it live in the problem domain or does it live in the solution domain? Well, if you are not on your guard for my asking such questions, you will probably say solution domain. Um, after all, you write C++ programs which solve problems using the built-in types. We all do that. Any non-C++ programmers here wondering what on earth I'm going on about? No, good, excellent. Um, but what if the problem is, how do we represent data in RAM or in CPU registers? Now, int is part of the problem domain. The solution domain is a pile of assembly language instructions. Problem domains go on to become solution domains for other problems. Let's actually look at the CPU and how we got to int. Okay, the CPU is what compilers generate code for. Okay, this is a diagram of a CPU which I found on the Red Hat website after a little Googling. I actually found lots and lots of diagrams of CPUs, each with different contents, and I had to find the one that was operating at the correct level of abstraction for this talk. You can start anywhere you like, really. The operation of a CPU is a constant whir of execution and state manipulation. 
You can see the A and B register, sort of a third of the way up in the middle. They're places where data are stored. And, here, and then we have the instruction register, which contains a single instruction. And we've got the ALU, that strange trapezoidal object at the bottom. The ALU combines registers and instructions to produce a result in the accumulator, which is written back to the level one data cache, or it could be written to the instruction pointer, because the instruction might be a jump, in which case the registers might contain the current instruction pointer and the relative jump size. The L1 data cache may get written back to the next level data caches. The instruction pointer then points to the next instruction to be executed. The registers are populated from the data cache, which may require the cache to be refilled from somewhere else via the memory management unit. And this diagram is an abstraction of the silicon, which makes up the CPU, the billions of transistors, the substrate manipulation, all of the really mind-bogglingly tricky stuff that processor manufacturers do inside their foundries can be represented by this diagram. The important features are state and execution. State is inspects, inspected and manipulated via execution to yield new state. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm overstating this, but the complexity of the CPU is tremendous, increasingly so as the years go by. One thing this diagram lacks is the notion of multiple cores. Branch prediction and instruction look ahead is underrepresented, is unrepresented. And those concepts would complicate the diagram still further and make the abstraction harder to grasp. When we look at the history of programming languages, they all involve state and transformation of state. The first language I learned was Atom Basic on an Acorn Atom. Um, that was back in 1980. Then I moved on to Sinclair Basic on the ZX81, and then to Z80 Assembly Language, and then 68000 Assembly Language. All of them involve state and execution at different conceptual distances from the CPU. And when I first started learning C, I was able to apprehend it as a macro assembly language. I could directly map between assembly instructions and C instructions. A for loop looks like a conditional jump back to earlier in the code. A bit shift operation looked exactly like a bit shift operation in 68000. The distance of abstraction was very small. C++, of course, offers a different kind of abstraction. We'll start with the easy stuff. Int is the fundamental built-in type. And you may have heard of long or short, but int is the machine word. It can be modified with unsigned, although I generally advise against that, as well as long and short. And as I said earlier, it is a representation of data inside the CPU, be it in registers or the cache. Now, when I first started programming CPUs, the registers were integer registers, particularly on the ZX Spectrum. If you wanted to do any non-integer arithmetic, you had to go to the built-in ROM, which used the RST28 instruction to launch into a fiercely cunning post-fix floating point calculator. It was amazing. It was a thing of beauty. In a few kilobytes of Z80 assembly language, it offered a scientific calculator. In fact, I spent the whole of the 80s working with integer maths. I worked in millimeters. It seemed precise enough for my purposes. I first came across floating point arithmetic in silicon with the advent of the Intel 80386. And more precisely, there was a maths coprocessor called the 387. And these two devices would work in parallel. And the cunning programmer would be able to work to much greater precision than fixed point arithmetic would allow. If anyone has heard of the i486DX, anyone old enough? Oh, 102, OK, yeah, usual suspects, OK. Yeah, this was the first chip with an integrated maths coprocessor, the first Intel chip. No longer were two parts needed. Floating point arithmetic was built into the silicon. Hurrah! PCs based on this processor were the gaming rigs of the 1990s. All of this narrative I'm sharing here is contained in the type float. Now, with modern processes, processors, um, there's a separate set of floating point registers, and the process is considerably simpler. When you use the float type, you're simply selecting one of those registers. Things start to get a little weird with bool. Um, this type is for storing Boolean values, that is true or false. And it would not be unreasonable to assume that this type is represented by a single bit. It is not, not necessarily. A quick glance at some output from Compiler Explorer will reveal that it is an 8-bit type for MSVC and GCC and Clang, where zero means false and everything else means true. 
And this might seem like quite a waste of bits, but the most efficient implementation requires these extra bits. Implementing um, as a single bit would introduce more complexity to the generated code and would diminish performance. There is a trade-off to be made between size and speed for this abstraction. Char, or car, if you're American, is a strange thing. It's a data type with a special purpose dealing with text. So whereas int and float, and for that matter, unsigned int, and double and long double, can be seen as analogs of registers or cache data, char has a little extra going on. It's used for storing elements of string literals. So when you type a pair of quotation marks and put some text between them, that is the type being used. There is, however, a significant problem, because char is only eight bits wide in the general case. The width is not actually specified by C, but the impl implementers all choose eight bits for the width of char. And as of version 14, Unicode has over 144,000 entries. This means that char is not up to the job for representing the entire gamut of written human expression. Historically, characters 32 to 127 correspond to those in the seven-bit ASCII character set, which forms the basic Latin Unicode character range. And straight away, you should detect a problem. The use of the word Latin should alert you to the parochial choice of letters. Of course, C doesn't care. It was designed for use on Unix, which was a US project. The keyword char is just a hint of the expected use of the type. Unfortunately, as an abstraction for textual representation, it is woefully lacking. The standard has added the type wchar underscore t for wide characters, which can be 32 or 16 bits wide, depending on your platform, and this is a loss for portability. Such string literals are prefixed with a capital L for wide. I wasn't there. <laughs> Meanwhile, operating system vendors have tried to come up with solutions to improve the representation of text. Windows has API calls for choosing between ANSI and wide characters, um, which you can switch between by choosing a preprocessor definition before including Windows.h. Um, the Unicode Consortium has catalogued a set of glyphs and provided a library for working with them. And C++ has, of course, inherited this type and added char32 underscore t, char16 underscore t, and char8 underscore t for UTF32, UTF16, and UTF8 character representation. It's not a great abstraction for text. There's one more fundamental type, which is void, and I suppose stood null putter underscore t, which is the type of the null putter literal. So now we have some abstractions for data on the processor. What about abstractions for execution? Well, this is the plain and simple function. It's easy to tell what it does. It has a meaningful name, which conveys that the parameter is going to be multiplied by itself. Note that the name is clearer than the code, at least marginally, because credibly you might say that square is potentially ambiguous as a name, while the code is not. Square could mean multiply a number by itself, or form a square of a particular side length, or it could even be a test to see if a number is square. Um, this returns us to the observation that naming is hard. Identifying your abstraction is the most important part of forming one. However, while the C++ code is unambiguous and immediately apprehensible, the assembly code is not. So this is the x86 assembly from Godbolt. Um, sorry, from Compiler Explorer. Now, there was a time when C was a high-level language and assembly was a low-level language. Level here means level of abstraction. Programming in C allows programming at a higher level of abstraction than programming in assembly. Programming in C++ allows programming at a still higher level of abstraction. Nowadays, though, very few people write in x86 assembly language. Consumer chips are so full of bells and whistles to improve performance that it's a waste of time to go straight for assembly, and a better idea to let the compiler optimize your code for you. Of course, forward declaration of functions is another form of hiding complexity. By simply stating that the function exists, you are advertising everything the client needs to know. They do not need to see the implementation. They only need to know that the implementation exists and that it does what the name of the function seems to imply or what the accompanying documentation says it does. But this is not the only form of abstraction available. A new facility in C++ 
well, nuisance C anyway, is function overloading. This allows you to reuse a function name. It's a form of polymorphism. The name is the important thing. The implementation is unimportant. Another way of viewing this is that the abstraction is independent of the type. It doesn't matter what you are trying to, whether you are trying to square an integer or a floating point type. Square means the same thing. What complexity does this hide? Simply the type of the objects being operated upon. We're left with a pure name. And we can go still further. This is a generic function, making explicit that the algorithm is irrelevant to the type, hiding yet more complexity. The use of requires clauses can further refine the declaration to make clear what kinds of type can be passed in. And then finally, we have lambda expressions, which construct a closure, an unnamed function object capable of capturing variables in scope. These are functions that can be passed around to functions again, hiding complexity, this time of mucking around with function pointers. And I said just now that programming in C++ allows programming at a still higher level of abstraction. Now consider what it means to program at a higher le level of abstraction. The native assembly instructions are replaced with more understandable C instructions. The complexity of assembly language is replaced with the relative simplicity of C instructions. But what about C++? Is that an even higher level language? Well, consider this house example. It's a struct. It's like a record in a database file table. In C, a typical interface might look like that, which would get me very angry. Um, this seems like a rather verbose way of modifying the members of the struct, given that you have a pointer to it in the first place. I've written about the horror of trivial getters and setters in the book. By the way, here's the book. There we are. Okay. Yay! Go a bit. No, don't applaud. <laughs> um, and that is precisely what, precisely what we can see here is getters and setters, trivial, doing nothing. And you could always write superior non-trivial interfaces like that, but it's all too easy to turn this into an untidy API. And you're still exposing the data to client interference. Classes make things a lot easier, especially with some of the additional features of C++. So in a break with tradition, I've put the private interface at the top so you can more easily observe what's going on. One thing that C functions allow you to do is abstract problem domain activity into the solution domain. However, replacing getters and setters with nouns and verbs enables you to create more meaningful abstractions. And this is one of the things that makes C++ a higher level language. We can directly model abstractions from the problem domain. Now, class, polymorph class polymorphism is not new to C++. It was available in C, although you had to hand roll your solution. And it would look something like this. You could write code by switching on the house type and calling the appropriate function, like so. And all sorts of things could go wrong here. Uh, you would have to manually ensure that you covered all cases. You would have to ensure that if a new enumeration was added to house type, all places where the enumeration was used would consider it. And this is a terrifically hard problem, requiring extremely disciplined behavior on the part of your engineers. However, this was widespread practice, switching behavior on a type field in a struct. But now we have the virtual keyword. So I've restored the public interface to the top of the class declaration. The virtual keyword signals to the client that the function dispatch may be resolved at runtime. There are a mix of pure virtual functions and regular virtual functions in the interface. Add a floor provides default behavior for when doing so isn't meaningful. What complexity does this hide? Well, it hides the complexity of choosing behavior based on dynamic type. By overriding virtual functions in a subclass, the switch case statement is rendered completely unnecessary. This complexity is not necessarily part of the CPU. It is part of the way that programmers write code. And I'm going to have to point out here, of course, that virtual functions carry quite a penalty. The code needs to inspect the virtual function table, locate the function pointer, and then call the function. This means a data cache miss and an instruction cache miss. And caches are quite modern inventions in the grand scheme of things. The virtual keyword enabling automatic dynamic dispatch was introduced in the 80s, while caches were introduced a good 15 years later. 
This doesn't mean that you should stop using virtual functions. It means that you should weigh up the cost when you decide how to approach the problem. If you go back to rolling your own switch case-based solution, you will suffer the same penalties. The question you should be asking is, how did you manage to get yourself into the situation where you've lost the static type of your object? Solve that problem, and you won't need to resolve function dispatch dynamically. For example, when you create an object of unknown static type, store it at creation in a collection with other objects of the same type. Losing sight of the static type of an object is a costly design decision to make. Static polymorphism is also available to classes, just as it is with functions. This takes a little more consideration. Recall that polymorphism eliminates implementation detail. It retains the identifier without having to specify certain parts of the abstraction, particularly the types. Dynamic polymorphism hides all the type information in a virtual function pointer table. Static polymorphism hides all the type information behind template parameters. And this is the most obvious with the standard library containers. What complexity is this abstraction hiding? It's the complexity of implementing the data structure for a particular type. A class is a set of functions and data with some invariants. If the data types don't matter, they can become template parameters. In fact, recall the full definition of vector. The mechanism of defaulting is another abstraction mechanism. What complexity is it hiding? It's hiding the complexity of choosing default behavior. This is not a trivial problem. It's solved for you by default arguments. There are other abstraction facilities offered by the class and struct furniture, but you get the idea. The class is the primary piece of problem domain abstraction. It enables you to model things from the problem domain in the solution domain. A meaningful name and a credible API are the essence of your abstraction. But to reiterate, structs and classes abstract from the problem domain. Functions and built-in types abstract from the solution domain. Problem domains become solution domains. This last point is very important. Here's an interesting question. Are namespaces an abstraction facility? After all, they take a bunch of declarations, wrap them up in a pair of curly braces, and give them a name. The effect of declaring something in a namespace means it goes from this to this. Is this hiding any complexity? I don't think so. Um, namespaces provide a facility to disambiguate common names, which does not remove complexity. It makes the code easier to read. It increases the number of useful names you can give to declarations, but it isn't hiding any complexity. If anything, it is preventing complexity. For example, look at these two function names. It's quite useful, usual to name abstractions by domain and then by abstraction so that you know whereabouts the things live and what they're for. And this is fine while your code base is reasonably small, but once you reach a million lines of code, which is very common in game development, you're in danger of naming things like this. And this becomes pointless if you're writing code inside the AI entity code. Nothing is served by making your game's names long and prefixing them with AI underscore entity. The facility of namespaces allows you to offer domains of abstraction to the compiler and a simpler means of disambiguation, although it does bring its own problems. Hello? Yeah, sure. What about anonymous namespaces? What about? Anonymous namespaces, do those hide details? Is that a form of abstraction? Uh, no, because anonymous namespaces live inside translation units. They're entirely visible. Effectively, they're a replacement for the keyword static. I don't think, I don't think they are. And what about um, choosing a namespace based on the using name, allowing you to sort of change your implementation? Would that be considered a? Say that again. So if I have, um, several different namespaces that all have the same functions, and I choose by a using name which one I want um, to expose that particular namespace, would that work? Hmm. Uh, it doesn't feel like it. No. That feels, again, that feels like you're possibly causing problems. There, there, there's no particular feature of C++ that's being used there other than um, Namespace, namespace resolution, scope resolution, I suppose. I'm going to think on that. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, this is a using directive. Uh, look at that. As if by magic. 
Um, the core guidelines suggest you should avoid declaring you're using directive in a header file. Um, there is an exception, actually, um, which is the std literals namespace. You need this to use string literals in header files. Um, however, I don't think the core guidelines go far enough. Um, I think, with the exception of the std literals namespace, you should never use a using directive. Um, I devote a whole chapter of the book to why you shouldn't do this, but briefly, a using direct directive does not only introduce new symbols into the current scope. A using directive introduces its new meanings into the scope, which is the lowest common ancestor of the current scope and the target namespace's own scope. And this can be quite surprising, and it becomes more surprising as a code base grows and acquires more namespaces. Obviously, we're drifting off topic here, but I won't go into detail, but it suffices to say, do please don't, don't use using directives. Nor is a namespace an abstraction facility, despite appearances. Libraries, on the other hand, are most definitely an abstraction facility. In tandem with header files, they have the, you know, they're the bread and butter of code reuse ever since C was a twinkle in Koenigan and Ritchie's eyes. It's a simple mechanism. What's going on here is that the compiler passes the declarations in mystuff.h and then uses that to inform the remainder of the translation unit. And this is great. You have a consistent way of making a set of declarations and reusing them in other translation units. You're able to adhere to the one definition rule and have that one definition be consistent. Brilliant. It's great. You know, the definitions of those declarations are either made in a header file with static linkage or included in a library file. And so there we are. Mystuff.lib abstracts all the implementation complexity behind a simple header file. And we've been using this mechanism for a very long time now, although it's not without its costs. Modules are the first new language level abstraction facility for a long time, actually. Consider the inclusion model. The problem it solves is ensuring identical redeclaration of types and functions by means of lexical substitution. So when you type hash include matrix.h, the preprocessor will hunt around for that file, open it, and add it to the stream of text for compilation. It comes with a few problems, though. The mechanism used by the preprocessor to find the file is implementation defined. What works on one toolset may not work on another. The preprocessor is language agnostic, so it knows nothing about whether or not the code is correct during inclusion, potentially burning up valuable time before the compiler gets to it and tells you that it's malformed. It relies on the linker to provide the definitions for these declarations which again knows nothing about compilation. The inclusion model attempts to solve the problem of code reuse without using the compiler at all. This means that opportunities for optimization are lost, and we can and must do better enter modules. The big deal with modules is that they turn libraries and programs into reusable components. A module is a set of source code files that are compiled independently of the translation units that import them. They have no effect on the compilation of the translation unit that imports the module. After a module is compiled once, the results are stored in a binary file that describes all the exported types, functions, function templates, and class templates. The compiler can process that file much faster than a header file, and the compiler can reuse it every place where the module is imported in a project. Um, proposing modules came with a big pile of problems to solve. What do you do about preprocessor symbols? Argument-dependent lookup. It took a long time to answer these questions, and this isn't a prime run module, so I won't go into the results, but I will give you a quick example of what, what a module looks like. And this is shamelessly lifted from the modules page on cppreference.com. Incidentally, that page says in its own paragraph that modules are orthogonal to namespaces, which is worth mulling over later if we have time. Um, so from the top, the first line informs us that we're declaring a module. The second line imports IOStream, and note that it doesn't include it, it imports it. When the compiler imports IOStream, it will see that it is not a module since it doesn't contain an export keyword. The third line actually defines something, a function called hello, and marks it for export into the module defined by this source file. So the source file which consumes this module looks like this. I hope it's reasonably obvious. At line one, rather than include hello world, we import hello world. Otherwise, things don't look too different from the familiar include model. The source file main.cpp is importing a definition, a void function called hello, and calling it. Now, I'm not an implementer. These folk are amazing. I just make games. 
Um, but I would like to think that my mental model of the inclusion process is not too far from the import process. And I imagine that when I hit build in my IDE, the dependency scanner will look at the modules and build them first if necessary, and then simply add them to the compilation stream as requested by the import declaration. If you're familiar with pre-compiled headers, you may see parallels here, but modules are not pre-compiled headers because modules can selectively export names. Pre-compiled headers export everything. Now, looking back at the import of IOStream, when hello world.cpp is compiled and turned not into an object file, but a module, it will include all the types, functions, and templates that are declared in that file. It only needs to be parsed and built once rather than every time, as is the case with headers. This alone justifies the use of modules for me. What complexity is this hiding? I've asked this question many times. The reason is that that's the purpose of abstraction, to hide complexity. Where we were using the preprocessor and the linker to enable the reusing of code with all the problems that that brings, we're now doing it within the compiler itself with much finer grained control available. We've migrated from encapsulation to abstraction by offering the encapsulation in place and offering control in the solution domain. And you might think that this means the end of the linker, or, or, or at the very least, the librarian, but there are some considerations because, for example, with Microsoft's compiler, a module and the code that consumes it must be compiled with the same compiler options. And also, if you want to consume the C++ standard library as modules, you must compile your programs with these two flags. That is standard stack unwinding in the DLL version of the standard library. Stack unwinding is an expensive feature to add to your program, and not one that we use in game development. Right, any questions before we move on? I have stunned you all into silence. Right, let's look at this. Who is aware of this picture? Have you all kind of seen it? Yeah, it's a piece of computing history. It's amazing. It is amazing. This is... Oh. All right, this is called the OSI model. Um, and some of you can probably explain it in detail to me better than I can, frankly. Um, it's the open systems interconnect model in terms of levels of abstraction. Okay, so level one is the physical layer. The physical layer is responsible for the transmission and reception of unstructured raw data between a device, like a network interface controller, or an Ethernet hub, or a network switch. You know, a bit of hardware, chunky, heavy stuff you can hold in your hand. And a transmission medium, such as optical fiber, or copper cable, or even an antenna in the atmosphere for Wi-Fi transmission. It converts the digital bits into optical, electrical, or radio signals. That's level one. The specifications of the physical layer include things like voltage levels, voltage change timings, physical data rates, and so on. It's stuff to do with the wiggling about of electrons. This is soldering iron stuff, the, the arena of the electronics engineer. Who can use a soldering iron? The rest of you are not full stack developers. Thank you. <laughs> I have opinions about full stack developers. Um, these specifications are the abstraction. Um, the physical layer is implemented either as a simple Ethernet card or a network switch, as I said. And there is a consistent interface to the hardware. And this interface is exploited by layer two, the data link layer. Layer two doesn't care how layer one is implemented. It simply relies on the specifications being adhered to. And it takes advantage of the abstraction offered by layer one to carry out its task, which is the transfer of data between nodes. It handles establishing and terminating a connection, error detection, error correction, flow control between the two nodes. It requires no knowledge at all of whether or not the data is transferred by light pulse or electrical voltage deltas. Anyone else here into standardization? Just me, okay, that's fine. Someone has to do it, and I'm quite happy to step up to that particular plate. Um, who's heard of IEEE 802? Great, okay, that operates at this layer. Um, 802.3, that's Ethernet. 802.11, that's Wi-Fi, okay? You do know all this stuff, you really do. These all operate at the data link layer. It's what you're interested in when you subscribe to a broadband subscription, broadband provider. Um, 
The point-to-point -point protocol is a data link layer protocol that can operate over several different physical layers because those level one physical layers all expose their operation in the same way. Okay. Right, layer three, network layer. This transfers packets, and it's really easy to describe, but there's a lot going on under the hood. For example, it handles routing packets to the correct destination. It's a monumental job. Splitting packets that are too large, but there's no guarantee of reliability. There's no guarantee of error reporting. So I'm hoping you can see a picture emerging of dependency upon abstraction. Layer four is the transport layer. It provides the functional and procedural means of transferring variable length data sequences from a source host to a destination host, from one application to another across a network while maintaining quality of service functions. And this may require breaking large protocol data units or long data streams into smaller segments, since the network layer below that imposes a maximum packet size called the maximum transmission unit, which depends on the maximum packet size imposed by all data link layers on the network path between the two hosts. The transport layer also controls the reliability of a given link between a source and destination host through flow control, error control, and acknowledgements of sequence and existence, all of this kind of stuff. Reliability, though, is not a strict requirement within the transport layer. Anyone use UDP? Lots of people use UDP, come on, yeah, yeah. Okay, UDP, um, it's used in applications that are willing to accept some packet loss, reordering errors, duplication, don't care. Streaming media, real-time multiplayer games, Voice over IP, they're applications which loss of packets, loss, lots of, for which loss of packets don't really present a problem. Layer five is the session layer. Now the session layer creates the setup, controls the connection, and ends the teardown between two or more computers, and that's called a session. DNS operates in this part of the layer. Common functions include user logon, name lookup, user logoff functions. Now, this might start to sound like C++ programming. You could implement all of this using constructors and destructors because sessions have a well-defined start and end point. The session layer establishes and manages and terminates the connections between the local and remote application, and all of this relies on the transport layer being able to move data from device to device. I hope this is becoming clear because complexity is being hidden by well-defined layers of operation. This is layered abstraction. Layer six is the presentation layer. It establishes data formatting, data translation, protocol conversion, encryption, compression, all of these things. It relies on the session layer to have correctly established the communication points and the context that brings with it. And layer seven is the application layer, which defines the protocols to use, which compression, which encryption. HTTP and SMTP are application layer protocols. You're all programmers. I imagine you're pretty familiar with protocols like this. But let's look at a more concrete example, a file parser for command line options. Early in the execution of a program, I want to read in some options from an external file identified on the command line. They're declared as key value pairs. There are only a few dozen possible options, but being a smart engineer, I decide to create a separate function for doing this, and I'm going to call it parse options file. That's what Tony would call it. Tony would call it parse options file. I'm gonna call it parse options file. It will take a file name, which I will pull out of the command line, and if none is declared, I will not call the function. There we are. Boom. Um, the function body is simple. Open the file, read each option line by line, and update the state appropriately until we reach the end of the file. And I can easily add new options in one place. I can withdraw old options without any hassle. And if the file contains invalid options, I can just notify the user in the final else declaration. So, pretty happy with that. A couple of days later, a new option is defined whose value could be several words, though, and that's fine. I can just read until the end of the line in that option, and I'll create a 500-character buffer and make a string from it. Yeah, Kate's shaking her head. She knows what's coming. <laughs> so I've come up with a simple, flexible way of parsing options. I can just add code for each option. This is delightful. The following week, a colleague tells me that some of the tokens are only valid if the user has set the debug flag, but that's fine. That is absolutely fine. I set the debug flag at the top of the function, 
so I can query it later in the function and be sure that I only apply tokens when they're applicable. Mind you, I'm keeping track of state now. That's something to be mindful of. Next month, incorrect preferences files are causing a stir. And I'm asked to apply the preferences only if they are all valid. I sigh. That's fine. I can create a preferences object containing all the new state and return it if it's valid. Stood optional will come in super useful here. But unfortunately, this function is so useful that people have started using the options file themselves. And there are now 115 preferences being parsed. And I appear to have created an enormous junction box with lots of state and a bajillion conditional statements. And every bug related to the preference file is going to be mine to solve, regardless of who put it there. That's just how people work. How can we fix things? Well, you might decide to declare a single function for each option. And this is a good idea because it at least highlights that the responsibility for bad behavior lies with the person who wrote the individual options parsing function. And it will be hard for people to wriggle out of that responsibility and land it on me. Validity can be checked and reported within each function. You can signal an error somewhere, somehow, or send a note to standard output. And we've encapsulated all the different options in their own function, and we can easily add further functions for new options, growing the parsing function for each one. We still need a way of tracking the validity of the options file. Other users of the function should get the hang of things, though. They will see a pattern, and they will follow it. Or will they? Because your spidey senses should be kicking off about now. There are so many places where this could go wrong. So let's bring abstraction to the party. We're trying to parse a file of key value pairs and apply the results to the environment if they're valid. The function is well named, parse options file. The problem we have is safely adding arbitrary key value pairs. Is the identity of the full set of pairs actually relevant to parse options file? Is it within scope? Can we separate the options from the function? At the moment, we're simply pulling keys from the file and checking each in an ever-growing if-else statement since we cannot switch case on strings. And this sounds like an associative container. In fact, a map of keys against function pointers sounds perfect here. Suddenly, our function has lost a huge amount of repetition and been replaced with a single interrogation of a map and a corresponding function call. The important part of this function is that it parses an options file and does something with each key. Unfortunately, along the way, we've lost the capability for values to contain spaces because the Chevron operator will stop extracting when it reaches white space. But this is certainly feeling better. All we must do is initialize the map of keys and function pointers, but we've just moved the problem around. The initializer is another point where users can trip up. It's easy to forget to update the initializer. Perhaps we can automate that. Well, we absolutely can, because rather than mapping keys against function pointers, we can map them against function objects with constructors and create static objects rather than functions. So here we are. The constructor for command can insert the address of the object into the map. In fact, we can derive all the function objects from a base class that will do that for us. And also, now that we have a base class, we can add a validation function and perform a validation pass followed by a commit pass. It all seems to be coming together. Indeed, you might think that we're all done here. Abstraction has carefully separated the options from the parsing function. Parse options file is like the session layer and the presentation layer in the OSI model, while the individual classes are like the application layer. But if parse options file is like the session layer and the presentation layer, does that imply that more abstraction is available? Well, yes, it does, of course. Because although we are parsing an options file, we're only actually reading a series of characters. They do not have to come from a file. They could come from the command line itself. We could rename the function parse options and change the input parameter to a std i stream. Look at this beauty. So we're taking a stream, pulling out the key and value, and then invoking the matching option function. As a bonus, if we don't find an option, we can decide it's a file name, open up the file, and continue parsing. So we get batch files for free. In fact, why are we pulling out the value? If we tell the commands to take a stream rather than a value, then the command can worry about extracting multiple values as appropriate. Indeed, better still, now that we have a separate function object for each key, we're not limited to initializing data. We can treat each key as a command. Suddenly, we've got a basic scripting facility. Flow control might be tricky. 
so whereas at the start of this example, the engineer had to extend a function in an unbounded fashion, all they must do now is derive a new class from command and override, validate, and commit. We've now moved from a single, potentially enormous parsing function to a small bounded function and a dictionary of parsing objects. We've also gained command line parsing at very little cost as an added extra. And this was all achieved by considering what was relevant to which part of the problem. What started life as a messy construct has become a clean and easily maintainable scripting facility with bonus content. Everybody wins. So let's consider the things that we did here to make this code better. The function was reduced in size. One sign of abstraction leakage is the massive function that tries to do everything. Finding abstractions is a great moment. It refines both your problem space and your solution space. Deciding that the parsing didn't care about the source of the data broke the back of the problem and revealed lots of options that sprung out from suddenly gaining a greater understanding of the problem. And towards the end of writing the book, Kate and I had a conversation where we both realized that the C++ core guidelines can largely, very largely, be rephrased as respects the level of abstraction. If you're a regular reader of Jonathan Bacara's blog, you will know that this is not a new goal for programming, but I think it's the most important. The purpose of language is abstraction. When you try to tell someone how you're feeling, we use language to make sense of our emotional state to someone else. We have a problem domain of how to communicate and a solution domain based around use your words. When we write code, we're trying to migrate something from a problem domain to a solution domain. The reason abstraction is C++'s superpower is because it has such a rich and increasing set of abstraction facilities available to it that it can be used to migrate problems to the solution domain of C++. Thank you very much. Ask me two questions. <laughs>